Hey guys, it's good to be with you. Um, I'm in a slightly different location than normal. We're up here at the hospital uh, in our hotel. Kristen's on like day three of her treatments. On Friday, she will, uh, she'll actually have her bone marrow transplant, the actual um, receiving the, the donor marrow and whatnot. And so she's doing some prep work right now. So we're staying here for the next two weeks. We'll be, I'll be in and out, excuse me, getting to see you guys. Um, so I'm in a little different location than normal, but that doesn't mean we can't look at the Lord's word. And we're going to look today at first Corinthians chapter one, or sorry, chapter six, verses one through 11. And since we're in a different context, I thought we'd do something a little different. I'm going to pop up my screen and I'm going to be doing some underlining and things of that sort. And so as we go along, I know that some of you guys are, um, it's always a little frightening to mark in your Bible sometimes. So this will maybe show some minor methods that I do. Uh, for those who've been marking a long time, um, follow along. It's always fun to see something different. But I thought we'd do something a little different today. Chapter 5 was all about um, church discipline, right? We determined that one of the primary functions of the church is dealing with issues of church discipline. Well, in chapter 6, we see an internal issue. So chapter 5 distinguished between in the church, out of the church. You can't exercise church discipline on somebody who's not a member of the church, is not part of the church. Um, and we talked about we as members submit ourselves under that. We submit ourselves to discipline. When I'm in the wrong, I submit myself to be corrected. Um, and that, that correction is not done out of anger or out of um, just a raw place of wrong authority. It's, it's actually done in the pursuit of becoming more like Christ as a collective. And so today we're going to be looking at an issue within the church and it's particularly dealing with lawsuits among believers. So uh, I'm going to pull the text up and then we'll read the whole thing and then we'll go through it as we normally do. So here it is. We have chapter six, verses one through 11. If any of you has a dispute against another, how dare you take it to the court before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Uh, or don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, how are you unworthy to judge the trivial cases? Don't you know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have such matters... Do you appoint as your judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one or there is not one wise person among you who is able to arbitrate between fellow believers? Instead, brothers go or brother goes to court against brother, and that is done before unbelievers. And then in verse seven, as it is. To have legal disputes against one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do this to brothers and sisters. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, no greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So we have a lot going on here, but basically this whole thing breaks into kind of three parts. Um, one is verses one through six, which is this call for internal investigation, right? Within the church, we, the church handles the church's business. Um, two is this right here in verse, I'm not crossing out the nine. Um, you get verses seven and eight, which is something of a, uh, them, Paul declaring shame on you, right? He's passing judgment here. And then you have 9 through 11, which is the separation of the Corinthians from the outside world. So let's begin, right, up here in verse 1. If any, I love, I always love that word any. If any of you has a dispute against another, okay, so you against another, 
linked by a dispute. This is in the church. We're not worried about outside the church. Not worried about the outside world. I'm worried about in the church right now. If any of you has a dispute against another, how dare you? How dare you? The indignation. How dare you? Right? I can almost, even though it's in writing, I can almost feel Paul getting choked up here. Is how dare you take or take it to court before who? The unrighteous. This is the outside world. This is this is the sinful world. How dare you? You Christian A and Christian B, how dare you take to court or take each other to court before the unrighteousness or before the unrighteous and not before the saints? How do you dare do that? Paul's almost pleading to them. How? How are why? Well, he, Paul is perplexed. He has no box for this kind of thought. Um, and there's this contrast between taking the conflict before the unrighteous and taking the conflict before the saints. Paul is not saying you will never have conflict with another believer, right? You, he's not saying you won't have disagreement. What he's saying is there's a place to disagree, right? When Paul and Jesus and really the Old Testament of the entire Bible has these dramatic calls to unity, how dare you take to court, take each other to court before the unrighteous and not settle it before saints? And then in verse 2, he goes on, or don't you know, I love that, don't you know, do you remember earlier in Corinthians, for those who have been with us here for a little bit, you'll remember that a big issue for the Corinthians is this this feeling that they have a higher knowledge, this this feeling of a pseudo um, a pseudo maturity, and Paul says, "Don't you know? This should be elementary. Um, we've all been in that moment where we definitely should have known something, and somebody came along and said, "I thought you would have known that." That's what's going on here. Don't you know? Don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge trivial cases? So Paul's saying, let me get this straight. One day, you're going to be in a position where you're sitting at the right hand of Christ. And you will have his righteousness. And you will be higher than sin, higher than the sinful world. And you're telling me that this trivial little case, you can't come together as Christians and figure this out. He continues with the same line of thought. Don't you know, I love we get that twice there, right? We get that doubling. Don't you know that we will judge angels? Which there's a lot of discussion surrounding this. The main gist, you can pretty much catch the same as, as what was previous. That He's saying, we're going to judge bigger things than this. There's bigger things that are going to happen. How much more the matters of this life? Corinthians, you're losing your marbles and you are way off base. You're worried about tiny things compared to what's coming. Verse 4 continues, if you have such matters, and I love that. So if you have such matters, do you appoint as your judges those who have no standing in the church? Paul says, I thought, I, I, I thought we were together in this. Wouldn't you... Would you have somebody in the church? Because you're a Christian. And if you're going to have somebody arbitrate between you, wouldn't you want somebody who has the right to, I don't know, one day judge angels or judge the world, right? Wouldn't you rather, wouldn't you rather have that person than somebody who has no right to judge either of those? Paul's being very snarky here. And he's being kind of mean to the Corinthians. He's really putting them down. But I think it's for good reason. And it's to remind them that they're, They are a part of the church. They interact with the Holy Spirit. They cannot approach life from a human level. They have to approach it from a divine level. And no Christian is without excuse. Because if you claim to be a Christian, you claim to be aligned with the Holy Spirit. You claim to be aligned with what God is doing. You don't get to throw it off when it's convenient. And that's to all of us. So he says, why would you go get somebody who has no standing in the church to judge for you? Why would you want somebody who doesn't have the Holy Spirit to judge between you? I say this to your shame. I say it to your shame. This is not okay to you. I I, I want you to know that this is not okay. And then he says, can it be that there is no, or there's not one wise person among you 
And I love that because remember, again, they thought they had this great wisdom. Is there no one among you wise enough to deal with this? Who is wise enough to arbitrate between fellow believers? So Paul says, wait a minute. You said that you were you were wise, but is no one here wise enough to figure out between believers? The Holy Spirit's among you and you can't figure it out. Verse 6, instead brother goes to court against brother and that before unbelievers. Now I want to talk just for a moment because obviously there are legal cases among Christians and I do think this is not okay. And Paul's going to address what our attitude should be, right? And that is to take on the mind of Christ and to remember that in the words of Paul, I am the sinner of sinners. However, there are other courts that we tend to take our issues to. If you have a conflict with another believer, if you find yourself in disagreement with another believer, there is a proper way to have that disagreement. And one of the primary proper ways is not in front of unbelievers. I don't look for the world to weigh in on our decision. So if I'm in disagreement with a brother or sister and find myself at an impasse, I, I don't go to Facebook. I don't go to Twitter. I don't go gossiping. I don't run around doing things like that. I don't make a aha post. I don't do those things. Instead, I go to other believers, which I understand that COVID makes things tricky. But honestly, text messages, being as minimal as we can in trying to seek reconciliation. Remember, that's the key to all of this, right? Is Paul is not wanting us to be, he's not looking for right and wrong. He's looking for reconciliation because ultimately you and I are both wrong apart from Christ. And if we don't have unity, we're both in the wrong. I could be right or you could be right. And it wouldn't matter because we don't have unity. Therefore, we are not glorifying our Christ. And that is a greater issue at hand. Um, and so we see here, don't take this to the public square. These judgments should be done from within the body of Christ. So I'm pleading with you, and I know that things are spicy, right? There's a lot of political things. There's a lot of social things. There's COVID still. There's all these different opinions floating around. Maybe the best thing that you could do is get off of social media. Maybe the best thing you could do is not type that text, not type that post. Maybe the best thing you could do is not sit there in your anger, but to realize that unity is better and particularly unity, disunity in front of the world is not better than unity with other Christians. So that's the first bit. As Paul is calling them pretty hard to the table that what the, they have these disagreements, but the way that they are handling this, these disagreements is completely unacceptable because it's done not within the confines of the body. Now, suppose you find yourself in a bad place. Let's look at that. Verse six or verse seven, as it is to have legal disputes among one another is already a defeat to you. We've all lost already. If we feel that there is no place of reconciliation to the point that there's legal dispute, we have lost. No one is about to win. Why not rather be wronged and why not rather be cheated? I love that. Humble yourself. These are not words that we as Western Americans enjoy hearing. But wouldn't it be better just to be wronged than to wrong Christ in this way? Instead, always underline the word instead. When you run into the word instead, underline it, highlight it here. I'll even be good. We'll highlight that, right? Hi, oh, I guess I colored over it. There we go. Highlight it. Whatever you got to do, circle it. Um, instead, instead, do to the contrary of what you were going to do. Instead, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do so this to brothers and sisters. Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom. So Paul is saying that by wronging and cheating each other in this way, by dragging each other to court, by doing all these things, by not reconciling with one another, you are actually being opposed to God. You are getting lumped with the unrighteous. That's a scary thought. That when I am the opposite, when I am the antithesis of unity, 
I am being lumped with unrighteous. And the unrighteous do not inherit the kingdom. And then he goes on to define this. Do not be deceived. And then he lists off some pretty not great sins, right? Some some sins that nobody wants to necessarily be is the sexually immoral, the idolater, the adulterer, uh, the male who sleep, has sex with other males, um, the thief, the greedy person, the drunkard, the verbally abusive, uh, the swindler. None of these will inherit the kingdom. Can I just circle a couple words? There's no right um, to... Do not be deceived. Oh, look, here was another one was they will not inherit. Right? It's pretty clear language. None of these. But I don't want to camp out there. Before we go to the next verse, this is a great reminder that we are in that camp. At any given moment, we are in that camp. We are we are the only thing, apart from Christ, the only thing we are worthy of is not inheriting the kingdom of heaven is being written out of that inheritance. But in verse 11, you get a couple of key statements. One, but some of you used to be like this. You don't hear this one quoted as an inspirational verse. Some of you used to be like this. This is who you were. Apart from Christ, you were this, this creature that did not seek unity with Christ. You were one of those, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You were cleansed and you were washed. You were given new identity and you did nothing to earn it. You did nothing to deserve it. All the times that you think your your neighbor did you wrong, your Christian brother and sister, all those times, it reminds me of the parable of the the evil manager, right? Who he owed, he owed, I think it was 50 denarii or 50 talents i don't remember exactly which but he owed um or he owed 500 or some. he owed a gastronomical amount and the over shepherd for or the master forgave him then he went to somebody who owed him far less and threw that man in prison and beat him because he wanted what was his due that master returned and was not pleased with the cruel worker the cruel one who was forgiven Remember, you were forgiven so much because you were in that camp. You were opposed to Christ. Every one of us was opposed to Christ. And some of you were like this, but, but you were washed. You didn't wash yourself. You didn't make yourself good enough. You don't live righteously enough. You were washed. Christ did the work in you. Christ redeemed you. Christ gave you cleansing. You were sanctified. You were not good enough to be used by God. He cleansed you. He lifts you up. He uses you. And you were justified. You weren't justified because you were special. You were good enough. You were righteousness. You were righteous enough. You were justified in a name that's not your own. A righteousness that's not your own. So how dare us have such pride that we would destroy unity with a brother and sister and do so in front of the unbelieving world. What witness is that? What are we doing to our Christ when we act the buffoon and we squander our relationship with one another? Now, is this saying that there aren't times to stand on truth? Absolutely, there are times to stand on truth. That's always, we should always stand on truth. However, there's an appropriate way as a Christian, as a believer, to interact with our brothers and sisters. And that's not by yelling and raging. It's not by dragging them in front of the public square. It's not by doing any of these things. It's by loving them and remembering that I am the center of sinners and I must approach one another in that humility. So what do we learn about the church from this? We learn this about the church, that the church is made up of people and people are sinful by nature. We sinned with Adam and you will never meet a perfect person. But we are redeemed by our Christ. And apart from Jesus, we have no ability to have good standing and good relationship with one another. But in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God, 
we can be reconciled to one another. There is forgiveness of sin. There is this beautiful reconciliation. You don't need to go to court. You don't need to drag your brother and sister into the square. You need to be reconciled. You need to say, brother, I am sorry. Sister, I am sorry. I'm not honoring my Christ. Or if you're calling a brother's sin or sister's sin to light, brother and sister, I'm pointing this out to you, not because I am great, but because I love Jesus and I love you and I know you love Jesus. And I want to make sure to help you as you love Jesus. We do so in peace and love. We don't do so with vindictiveness. So that's this week's passage. It's a sobering passage in today's day and age. And I pray that we as a church, as Hampstead Baptists and as other churches, I pray that we would adopt the attitude of Paul and the attitude of Christ to remember that though we were sinners, Christ died for us and we were redeemed, not on a righteousness of our own, that we would boast, but by him so that he alone would receive glory. It's always good to be with you guys. Um, Next week, we're going to finish out chapter six. We're going to talk about what happens more specifically. So we're kind of narrowing our field, right? Last week was... What's the difference between an unbeliever and a believer? This week was what happens when two believers have a disagreement? Where do we disagree? Next week will be when two believers disagree. How do they be reconciled? And how should I maybe think ahead of the disagreement? So I hope you'll join in. It'll be great to be together. uh, Praying for you guys often. I can't wait to see you as soon as I get to. Love you all. Have a great night.